answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. And he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard, of, heard therefore, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore to the highways, as many as ye shall find. Bid them to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how comest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servant, Bind him hand and foot and take him away. Cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. My title for today is, So Do You Have the Right Good Intentions to Be Successful? So Do You Have the Right Good Intentions to Be Successful? When you read this passage of Scripture, it's, it's interesting that these, uh, to see there were intentions in this um, invitation, but they did not come. The word intention is a life-altering directive and where living intentionally begins. You see, intentionally occurs when you combine information and insight to compel you to action in, in, in important areas in life, in important areas in faith, in family, in health, in finances, in work. There's a lot of times, probably everybody here could say you've had intentions in one of these areas to do something better. You've had intentions to make your, uh, be a better uh, family man or a family woman. You've been, had good intentions to draw closer to God. You've had good intentions to uh, try to take care, uh, better care of your health, amen. You, you, you've had good intentions to try to be, uh, make more money. You've tried good intentions to be better at work or try to get a better job. They don't always fall in line with what we intend to do. But we have those intentions. And so, uh, <clears throat> intention is a word that means you decide to do something or plan to get a certain result. Now, many people's best intentions to succeed are not enough because good intentions do not align with progress. Many people hold the best intentions to uh, exercise. They hold the best intentions to try to lose weight. They hold good intentions to be committed to their marriage. And you can go on and on and on. But yet, so often many people fall short of achieving the results that they desire. Now often, oftentimes we have good intentions, but we don't follow through and complete the task. You know, the uh, New Year's resolutions, uh, most people kind of laugh when you mention those because most people know that the majority of the people never, in, never follow through. It may last a day. It may last a week. It may last two weeks. Uh, and that's why we kind of look at it as, well, that's kind of a joke, right? We call them New Year's resolutions, but they're really New Year's intentions. <clears throat> Amen? So, we oftentimes have those, and they're good. 
but we don't follow through. A man by the name of Napoleon Hill said this, one of the most common causes of failure is the habit of quitting when one is overtaken by temporary defeat. Amen? And a lot of times we're, we're, we're good at uh, following through and start on something and we feel really good, but the first time we mess up, we say, well, might as well just give up. It's not, they don't have it in their mindset to say, well, I've fallen, I'm going to get up and clean myself off and keep going. They just say, I give up. So, the primary reason that many people won't succeed is because they allow their defeats to weaken their commitment to prevail instead of pursuing success with a determined resolve. Man by the name of Jim Ron said this. He said, if you are not willing to risk the usual, you will have to settle for the ordinary. Amen? Now, the story that we read here this morning in Matthew 22, it talks about intentions. The king gave a wedding party for his son. People were invited. But when it was time to come to the party, the people who had been invited had other plans. And they said, we're not coming. You see, they, have, they had good intentions to go, but they chose to do other things. The king told his servants to go out into the streets and gather all the people that they could find, whether it was good or bad, and bring them to the party. He was very frustrated and, and you know, said, hey, I, I've killed the cow or the, ca the calf and all this stuff. It's all, ready, it's all ready to go. Go get the people that said they would come. Now, why would he have to send for them? Probably because he's looking at his watch and nobody's showing up. Go get them. Uh, so here they are again. You know, they were probably excited when they received the invitation. You know, I'm going to the king's son's wedding. And I feel privileged to be invited to the king's place. And then life just got carried away. They had good intentions on going. Like we oftentimes as Christians, we have good intentions on in doing things, whether it be in your, in your family life, whether it be in church or whatever it is, we have good intentions. We want to get there, uh, you know, maybe not this year, but maybe next year we'll do this and we'll do that. And, and next thing you know, next year's turned into five years. And next thing you know, it's turned into eight years. The next thing you know, it's turned into 10 years. And we still have intentions on doing something, but we never do it. Time goes by before you know it. Amen? Folks, so the king says, hey, well, hey, don't worry about them. Go and gather everybody you can find, whether they're good or bad. Bring them to the party. Jesus wants us to understand is in this situation, folks, in this passage, that we are all invited to be a member of God's family. We're all invited to be helpers in the kingdom of God. God has something for each and every one of us to do. Amen? He wants us to understand that. So when we become a Christian and we join the family of God, we have good intentions oftentimes to honor God and to, make, to be of service to the kingdom of God and to others. But too often we get too involved with other things and sometimes... We just forget. We're too involved in life. We're too carried away in life. Folks, good intentions are only good if we follow through and complete the task. Amen? Some people are so good at saying, well, you know what we need to do? We need this and we need that. I like to say, are you volunteering? Huh? Oh, I know. There's a lot of things. I go to other churches. I see a lot of things that need to be done. But uh, who's going to do it? So good intentions are only good if we follow through and complete the task. You see, we, we must remember, we keep it in mind, we, to always honor God every day. To, and you need to be about the Father's business. Share the gospel Amen. Share God's love with others and through the word uh, and the works and the deeds that we do. Amen. Good intentions to God, our good intentions oftentimes need to be 
God's intentions for us. That's where we can work things out. That's where, you know, a lot of times we, we failed in so many areas. That's why we realize and we come to an altar someday and say, God, I need you. I've made a mess of things. And, and God fills us with his spirit and, and, and we're baptized in his name and, and God starts working on us. And all of a sudden we follow back into our old habits a lot of times of I'm going to do this, but I just don't do it. So... Our good intentions need to be God's intentions for us. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 10 says, Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. (coughs) I'm reading this from the... Boy, I can't see that on that screen, folks. We, uh, our computer crashed here a few, a week or so ago, and we're we're putting everything back, so they don't, they don't, may not have the new living Bible transversion that I have, translation that I have here. But it says, carefully determine... What pleases the Lord? Now, I knew they didn't have this from before, but they're going to try to get it for me. The Message Bible says this. Figure out what will please Christ and then do it. Okay? Figure out what will please Christ, then do it. In your life, folks, many of us know what God, what God wants us to do. And we just keep saying, someday, someday. Maybe next, maybe next year. If I could just get this done in my life, and then I'll do that. Right? You know, I, I used to have my own business remodeling. And uh, I did it for about four or five years. <laughs> one, of the, one of the best places to go to get a job when you go interview somebody, and they call you, you're answering an ad or something, they call you. And uh, it's where you go in where a guy has started something in the house himself. Three years ago, I went to one house. <laughs> a lady was doing dishes downstairs in the wash tub for a while. <laughs> and she looked at me. She says, I want this kitchen done. You know, you got the job, folks. I'm telling you. <laughs> it's, but he had good intentions. You know what? I'll bet he never gets to start another project in the house again. <laughs> He's been going to fix that kitchen forever. You know what some people are so good at? Tearing stuff out. But when it comes to putting the puzzle back together, they're like, ah. You can take that puzzle in the box and shake it all up and dump it on the table. But put it together is pretty hard, isn't it? But you have good intentions. You know, and and for, for weeks you may see a couple little chunks of puzzle over here and you know the corner done over here and you know oh I found the sun right figure out what pleases God and do it folks what should be the basis for your intention what should be the basis or a better way to say it what does God look at in my life to judge that my intentions are right And from him. What is it that God can look at and say, okay, you need to get rid of this and this and this. 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 7 says this. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. Have anybody here girl? Anybody girl? Nobody girls? I do. I love to grill. Okay? Anybody ever use one of those grill thermometers or a thermometer you stick in the side of meat? Anybody ever use those? Good. All right. Got a couple people cooperating here. Now, the steak on the outside may look done. But the thermometer will reveal whether the meat is fully cooked inside. Our lives are the same way, folks. Appearances are fine, but deep down are areas that are still not done to completion. And so we may look at the mirror and say, yeah, I look pretty good. I look like a good Christian. Now, in, 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 the appearance a lot of times is what, what we want other people to think too. But so often, folks, we fool ourselves by when we look in the mirror and say, yeah, I look, I, I look like I, I do the part pretty good. 
But God says, wait a minute, I've stuck the thermometer in there, and there's some areas that still need worked on. There's some areas that need a little more time in the cooker. Nobody likes to go through problems. Nobody likes the heat turned up on us. But God says, you got to stay in there a little longer. So folks, what is the mechanism the Lord uses to help you see inside yourself? Hebrews chapter 4, 12 through 13 says, For the word of God is, a li is, is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and moral. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. The Bible is the thermometer. So we often look at Scripture as a guide. We often look at Scripture as encouragement. And, and that's a good thing. We, you know, that's great. We need it for that. But the Word of God will also be like that thermometer. It will pierce you. It's, 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 it's a, it, it'll challenge you to place your life's journey in alignment with God's intentions. And so, that's why so many people, folks, they pick the Bible apart, and they take this, and they take that. Oh, this is great. This is a beautiful little scripture. I love that. That encourages me. Well, what, what about this scripture over here that tells you, oh, I don't like that. Come on. Amen. We, we, it, it, it will it'll cut things apart. It'll, it'll take sections out. And we, we don't like that kind of stuff. But for the word of God will also be that thermometer. It'll pierce you. See, at, at this point, it's one thing to say you're going to, going to use this insight to live intentionally. It's quite another to actually move forward with it. Now, I want to look at a... Pro, uh, look at procrastination, and sometimes that's why uh, we're so uh, good at having these good intentions and never finish them is because we procrastinate. All right? Procrastination and the good intentions creates, and they stay unrealized, and, they, and sometimes can even be destructive. Okay, hear me what I'm saying, folks. We procrastinate sometimes with our good intentions, okay? And, and those intentions stay unrealized. They st and sometimes it's to our destruction, right? See, more than just a good intentions is what we need in our heart. More than just good intention. <clears throat> God's intentions are what's best for us. Procrastination is progressive and it stifles your efforts to live an intentional life for Jesus Christ. Martin Luther said this. He said, how soon, not now, becomes never. Thank you. I'll say it again. How soon will you do it? So he's saying, how soon? I'm saying, how soon will you do it? Oh, not now. That becomes never. Because we procrastinate. Nicodemus was with Jesus in, in John 3. Paul stood before Felix. These people procrastinated. You want to serve God? Not right now. I'll wait for a better time. And they are both examples of people who had good intentions about knowing and following God. But they procrastinated. Never following through on what was told them. You see, folks, you can easily do that as well. We know we hear things time and time again. We hear things come across this pulpit, and we say, I need to do that. I want to do that. We may even come to the altar and weep before the Lord and say, God, help me, Lord. I, I, I've been, uh, you've been talking to me about this for a while. I need to do this. I need to do that. I'll get to it next month. We can do that as well. Put things off and put things off and put things off. Knowing we should be doing it. Psychologists have identified many reasons why we procrastinate. Complex projects seem intimidating. We get intimidated with things and so it's easier just to put it off. Projects are assumed unpleasant. 
late uh, lack of ability to prioritize things keeps us from doing things. Here's a big one. Fear of failure. Come on. Distractions. You see, I understand a lot of these things. I've, uh, I've, I've, I've done a lot of projects and building and things of that nature. One of the things is just doing this right here, doing all this. This was a big undertaking right here because when I took this floor, I see there used to be a platform that come way out here and it was round and then beyond that was another round one almost out to the seats there about this high. And so I'm looking at this thing downstairs, looking around, and I call my old boss that I used to work for, and I says, hey, can you come up here to this place and look at it and give me some ideas? He goes, Bill, he said, I would love to. I'm leaving in the car right now to go to Myrtle Beach. I can't do it. I says, okay. And this is things that I battle with sometimes in doing any kind of a project. It's like, all right, I can do this. <laughs> I can do this. And so I just have to... You, you folks, you guys don't even know how much I pray when I do things. Right? I remember I started a job in a machine shop one time, and I stood at that machine, and, and, and this was, there was prayer warring going on in, at a machine. God, help me. Help me. And so I brought all the young men that we had in my office and said, look, we're going to do this. Oh, yeah, let's do this. I said, hold on, guys. This is a big job. And so, but God help me with it. You see, sometimes we have fear of failure, and it wants to keep us. It's almost easier to say, man, I don't even want to think about it. And, 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 and folks, you can, you can put that scenario in any area of life. And sometimes people, in, in, when, they, when they, they get themselves into a, a marriage and, 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 and problems start coming, and they're like, they're not used to dealing with it. They're used to mom and dad handling everything. And so, see, you know, I don't want to deal with this. And they'll walk away from it. Uh, it. They're fine until, maybe they're fine in the marriage until the kids come along. And I don't know how to be a dad. I don't know how to be a mom. And, and so many people uh, fail at it and they'll just walk away from it. There's so many areas in life. Folks, we need to understand that God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And God will help you and bless you in so many areas. And he has done that in my life. Amen. He's done that so many times in my life, and I thank God for that. And psychologists understand this. And so we, they've done probably a lot of surveys and to come up with these things. So you have complex projects seem intimidating. Uh, projects are assumed unpleasant. La lack of ability to prioritize things. We need to prioritize when we need to do something. All right, I got to do this and this and this before I can even get to this certain stage. Amen. Fear of failure, distractions, many things, folks. Uh, but we, we have all heard the old saying, the path to hell is filled with good intentions. Folks, these good intentions have a definite pattern that may seem all too familiar. You see, good intentions recognize a need in your life that creates an interest where you want to know more, but then it leads to an emotional response, usually fear, that holds you back from doing anything else. Now, our truths about good intentions. Let's talk about some truths about good intentions. Good intentions are not decisions. They are illusions of good decisions. Think about that. I'll say it again. Good intentions are not decisions. They are just illusions about good decisions. A lot of people feel good about themselves just thinking of having a good intention. You know, you tell the wife about it. She says, oh, that sounds great. Yeah, I'm a pretty nice guy. <laughs> Months goes by. Are you going to do that? Yeah, I'll get around to it. I thought of it, didn't I? <laughs> it's an illusion you got, buddy. Good intentions release you from guilt, make you feel better, but you never take it any further. Good intentions are all about the future, but not connected to the now. Good intentions are not accountable to anyone else except yourself. 
Good intentions promise much, require little, but accomplish nothing. Good intentions are the facilitator of procrastination. So how do you go forward from having good intentions that do nothing to processing God's intentions? So I'll say it again. So how do you go forward from having good intentions that do nothing to processing God's intentions that do something and can be life-changing? See, that's what we want to go away from our good intentions. We want to process God's intentions that are life-changing. That's what we want. So what we need to even do God's is have a uh, God-given passion. I want to do something for God. A good intention alone is fed by procrastination and accomplishes nothing. But God's intentions, when birthed in your life, will not only move you forward, folks. God's intentions can accomplish the incredible for you and dramatically impact the lives of not only yourself, but impact the lives of others. Amen? An example of that is Nehemiah discovered God's intentions for his life by using the process of having a good intention, and then he took that intention and taking it to the next level. Nehemiah recognized in a need. He saw a need. The walls of Jerusalem were destroyed, and the people were in danger. And then Nehemiah Saw, after he saw that need, he created an interest where he wanted to know more. You see, Nehemiah didn't just go up and say, somebody ought to fix that wall. Somebody. We ought to get some people together and fix that wall. Somebody ought to do that. Nehemiah saw that need. And he took it further. Nehemiah, then Nehemiah created an interest where he wanted to know more. Nehemiah sought God for insight. Which then led Nehemiah to an emotional response, not fear, but a bold faith. You'll never get anything done without emotion. Amen? Nehemiah went to the king. Nehemiah secured permission, and he got the resources to rebuild the walls. And the key was, folks, it was this. Nehemiah asked God, what is your intention about this situation, God? What is your intention, God, about this situation? Amen. And you can read that from Nehemiah 1 to uh, Nehemiah 2. The, so he asked God, God, what is your intention? When Nehemiah received the answer from the Lord, he immediately, he didn't procrastinate, he immediately acted because he had, he had a God-given passion about a need. Often, people with bad intentions have more in innovation than those with good intentions because they, too, have a passion. It's a passion to kill, a passion to steal, a passion to cheat. Yet when you break through to discover God's intentions for you, you'll do the right thing based on his leading and direction, not your direction, not your leading, his leading, his direction. Amen? Folks, what are good God's intentions for you regarding your walk with God? What are God's intentions for you and your, uh, regarding your family? What's God's intentions for you regarding your health, your finances, your work situation? What are God's intentions for you in those areas? How can you employ your thinking, your emotions, and actions to live intentionally? How can you do that in your life? You start by finding the next right one. Next, write one thing for each area of your life. Start looking for those, those things that will help you in each area. And say, I'm going to enact this. I, I have to stop putting things off. 
I have to enact this and get this done and make sure that this is, this is going to help me move forward. I can't keep saying, someday, someday, someday I'll do this. Someday I'll get this right. Someday. And, and what it does a lot of times is just people around you just get frustrated with hearing you speak that stuff. And when you start, they just start saying, here we go again. Right? Get the fiddle. Anybody be like that around you? you? Do that yourself often. So it's so easy to put things off and then and regret. One of the things my my dad used to always tell my boys, I'm gonna build a train. He wanted to use those barrels and put wheels on them, you turn them on the side, put wheels on them, cut a hole in them for the kids to sit in and pull them all around. He never did it. But he, he always told him. He'd have him up on the knee. I'm gonna, Grandpa's going to build you a train. He had all these barrels stacked up in the back behind a barn. Good intentions. Good intentions. So we all have these in our lives. And we probably all can maybe write one or two down right now. And say, I've had this. Just never got to it. But I want to encourage you today, folks, in your life to understand that you have to enact these things in your life. First off, take the ones that aren't, aren't what God wants you to do and just get rid of them. Okay? Put God first. Amen? Seek God. Seek his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. And say, God, I want what you want. And when you put God first in, his, in, in the right position in your life, and you say, God, yeah, I see this situation. I see this that needs to be done. Help me to do it. And another thing is, in, in, in adding to that, what I just said, is when you see a need, folks, God, are you, are you helping me to see this need because you want me to do it? We're so, so easy, it's so easy to push it off let somebody else do it. Let this person do that. Somebody else can be better at it than me. God wants to use you. Amen? God wants to use you. So how can you employ your thinking, your emotions, your actions to live intentionally? Start living intentionally. I'm going to do this. I want to get this done. I want people to see that I'm not a procrastinator. I want people to just don't want to just, oh, here he goes again. I don't want that. Amen? You want to be the type of person that people can count on. <clears throat> you want to be somebody that they know if you tell them you're going to do it, you'll do it. I've told that story many times, how my pastor asked me to do something. Okay, I'll do it, yeah. And the last minute, I got, uh, you know, I was a young boy and red-blooded American. I had a girl that I needed to go get and said, hey, pastor, I'm going to go get this girl. And if I'm not back in time, will you do it? Pretty stupid. You know what he told me later on? If I'd have been right there, I'd have punched you right in the face. Guess who never did anything like that again? Me. You see, folks, I didn't want to dis disappoint my pastor anymore. I never wanted to disappoint him. I never wanted to disappoint God. Amen? And that's what we do. We disappoint our family members by, you know, getting them excited about, let's do this, let's do that, and never follow through. We disappoint our brothers and sisters. And you say, well, they don't even know it. Well, it could be a blessing to the kingdom. And God wants to use you to do it. And it probably won't get done unless you do it. Well, God can use anybody. Yeah, but God wants you. God tapped you on the shoulder. Do you think maybe God might have had somebody else to tap on the shoulder? Is it for people in the Bible that God called to do things? What if they wouldn't have done things? Amen. You see, start finding out that next, that one thing, that next right thing for each area of your life. And you can live by Ephesians 5.10, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Ephesians, in the message, it says, figure out what pleases Christ and do it. And do it. 
You see, folks, there's so many people that have lived a life of regret. They live a life of regret. My dad, I told this story before, but he came down when I turned 18 in the middle of the night, yanked me up, hugged me, weeping, crying. I was rubbing my eyes like, what in the world is going on? And he looked at me and says, you're a good kid, Bill. You're a good kid. He wanted to do more with me, but he was always busy doing this and this and this, trying to get ahead, trying to make a living. We worked a lot of jobs together, but we didn't go hunting. We didn't go fishing. We didn't just do things together and having fun. He started that with my other brothers. But see, 18 years got away with him. And he regretted it. I love my dad. I told him, I wrote him a letter one time and said, I am in large part because of you, what you are. But see, folks, we, we can regret things. And sometimes we try to fill it with buying people this and buying them that and giving them this. They want you. Okay? And we can do the same thing to God sometimes. We'll give him this. We'll give him that. We'll give him, here, I'll give you a nice offering, God. I'll do this. God wants you. He wants you. He tapped you on a shoulder for a reason. He showed you a specific need that needs to be done for a reason. Live with God's intentions, not just good intentions, but live with God's intentions, folks, and say, God, I'll do this. I'll give you help me. God has helped many. When you go through many stories in the Bible, God helped them in areas that they thought they would never be able to do. And God wants to use you, and God will help you and give you all that you need to do his will. Amen. Let's stand here today. done a little bit early here at a quarter till we, our break is going to be there anyway so at quarter till if you'd like you want to run downstairs go to the bathroom throw some water in your face uh, you know wake up whatever if I put you to sleep I'm so sorry all right I don't think they have coffee or anything like that but you can go down there and, and get back up here we're going to have uh, start at uh, the top of the hour parents when they bring the kids up please Meet the parent, meet the teachers, and get your kids so they don't, you know, you think, oh, if I just don't notice, maybe they'll go sit with somebody else. But they're yours! <laughs> and God gave them to you! Amen. Amen. I'm excited about what God's doing. Amen. And we're uh, pleased that you're all here, taking a part in this new adventure for us. Let's just ask God to bless the rest of this service. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for your goodness and your mercy.